Before you sit down, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say you're in the right place at the right time right now. Uh, but we're in a new uh, sermon series that we've been talking about. We just started it last week. And we've been talking about the words from the cross. And what the theme is, is Jesus made seven statements as he hung on the cross. And those seven, seven statements are prophetic. He fulfilled prophecy when he made those statements. But there's also benefits that you and I receive because of those statements. And we have probably seen them written. You maybe have read about them, but didn't realize the power behind what Jesus was saying and the statements that he was making and how they affect you and I and really the whole human race. And so there are seven statements that he made. We won't be able to go through all of them and we're not going through them in any necessary order, but I just believe today that every statement is going to help you and gonna bring clarity to your life of why Jesus made these statements. So I'm gonna read uh, John chapter 19 and I'm gonna read a statement that probably most of us are kind of familiar with. And it's found in John chapter 19, verse number 28 of the scripture. And it basically says this, after this, Jesus knew that everything had been done. And I'll get into that, what everything that was completed so that the scripture would come true. In other words, this was the fulfillment of the prophetic word. And he said this statement, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us today. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that your word is true, that your word is powerful, that it applies to every part of our lives, even today in 2024. God, your word never fails. So I pray today, God, that you administer to every person sitting in this building today and those that are watching online. God, that your word would come alive, that it would quicken some things and speak into their heart. Lord, remove every distraction because we know that a lot of things that our minds could be on for this week can weigh on us, even some worries. God, remove that for the next few moments so that the people of God can receive the word. And I pray today for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that they would hear the voice behind the voice. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Let me get adjusted here a little bit. All right. I don't know why. It's kind of falling over here for some reason. Hold on. All right. Are you good? Okay, I think I'm good. Hopefully it doesn't fall while I'm preaching. If it does, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, but let me give you a bit of a context to what's happening here as Jesus made this statement, I am thirsty. Uh, we know through the word of God that Jesus hung on the cross a little over six hours. And so this is coming up on the sixth hour, and he's been crucified. We know on through, and in his final seconds of hanging, And this is one of the statements, I am thirsty. And what it shows us here when Jesus made that statement is the humanity of Christ. Jesus said a lot of things in his lifetime, but one of the things that was key here as he hung on the cross is these words, I am thirsty. Last week I talked about how Jesus hung on the cross and he made the statement, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And of course, we know that the, one of the first words was that, and most of us, if we'd be honest, after being tortured and after being now to a cross, I don't think our first word is gonna be, Father, forgive them. Am I right? I'm a, we'd probably say, I'm gonna find a way to get you back, <laughs> right? But Jesus, so most of us probably wouldn't have been able to say those words, but all of us have said these words, I am thirsty. At some point in your life, you have been thirsty. You have been looking for some water to quench your thirst, and all of us have said these words, 
in our lifetime is I'm thirsty. I need something to drink. I need something to quench my thirst. Uh, the, Greek, the Greek translation, the original Greek, is actually only one word. And the word is deep, deep, deep sow is the, how they pronounce it in Greek, deep, deep sow, meaning I am thirsty. And again, these words here are really packed with a lot of meaning. And so, in fact, let me read the scripture again, a couple more scriptures with it. In John chapter 19, verse 28 and 29, let me read it again. It said, after this, Jesus knew that everything had been completed. I'm reading out of another translation. So that the scripture would come true, he said, I am thirsty. And there was a jar full of vinegar there. So the soldier stuck, soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a branch of hyssop plant, and he lifted, up, lifted it up to Jesus' mouth. Now, most of us probably are familiar with this, but 60% of our body is made up of water. That's why when you really, when you first lose weight, they tell you you're losing a lot of water. They said that if you weigh about 150 pounds, you're actually carrying about 12 pounds of water. Some of us are carrying a little bit more, but uh, <laughs> I was going to say we could tell, but no, we're not going to say that. But you can't live without water. Ignore that. Strike that from the evidence there. But uh, all of us have probably experience uh, dehydration. They said dehydration is really bad for you. Uh, and really, sometimes dehydration is the cause of a lot of headaches. People have a lot of headaches because they're not drinking water or muscle cramps. Or even if you, you feel like your brain is shutting down because you could be dehydrated. All you really need is water. They said uh, many people are fatigued, and the reason why they're tired and fatigued is because they're really experience, experiencing dehydration, and they need some water because your body runs on water, and if you don't have enough water, you become lethargic, so you need to make sure that you get enough water. In fact, uh, when you get surgery, I don't know if anyone here has had surgery before, I've never had, but what happens is when you get surgery, one of the first things after you wake up because you've had this, this stuff going down your throat and everything else, the anesthesia, and your throat is sour, your throat is dry, and your lips are dry, man, and you just can't wait to drink some water. And I've been to hospitals where people just had surgery, and I've been to hospitals where, you know, someone had just got the pipe removed out of them and all of this and prayed with them. And one of the first things is they say, Pastor, can you give me a cup of water? I said, well, I don't know if I should be able to give you a cup. Yeah, yeah, they're giving me that little sponge thing. Give, give me a cup of water. Hold on a second. I don't want to get in trouble here. Uh, uh, no, don't give me the swabs. I don't need a little ice chip. Get, I need a gulp. Go get me a gulp, man. I want one of those things to drink it down. And because they're thirsty, and all of us have experienced probably that kind of thirst. So Jesus had been on the cross for six hours, uh, and actually, I want you to just take note of this because I think it's very important. Earlier, when Jesus was first put on the cross, they actually offered him something to drink, and Jesus turned it down. So there's two separate times where they're giving something to Jesus, but the first time, he didn't ask for anything. They put him on the cross, and they're trying to give him something to drink. In fact, Mark chapter 15, verse 23, this is why it's important what I'm saying here. They said the soldiers tried to give Jesus wine that was mixed with myrrh, but he refused it. The reason why he refused it, because this spice, again, was called myrrh, and it was mixed, and really what myrrh became when it was mixed with wine, it became a type of narcotic. It became a painkiller. And if you remember, one of the things that they brought to Jesus when he was born is they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, really kind of prophesying his death. But really, myrrh was used when a person was dying and they needed to relieve the pain. It was a type of narcotic. They, back then, they didn't have Advil. They didn't have 
any kind of Vicodin. Hopefully you're not on Vicodin. And so they would mix it and they would give it to the person that was hanging on the cross and to ease the pain. Now you would think, wow, you know, these Roman soldiers, man, they were really compassionate. Uh, this is very uh, humanitarian uh, gesture to try to give Jesus this myrrh, this painkiller, but that's not actually what was going on because to tell you the pain of the crucifixion, the excruciating pain, is often the person that was hanging on the cross being crucified would be there for hours and hours on end and eventually the criminal who hung on the cross would scream for hours. They would just hear this guy screaming for hours and hours and the Roman soldiers had to stay there until he finally died. And so what the soldiers would do in order to keep him from screaming so much, they would give them this murder to try to quiet them down. So it wasn't for Jesus' benefit, it was for their own benefit. But because Jesus wanted to feel, listen to me, the full impact of the pain of carrying the sins of mankind, he refused the painkiller. He took the pain for you and I. He took the full brunt of the pain. He wanted to feel every physical ounce of that pain and he didn't want any drugs to mess it up or to uh, basically eave, but he wanted to take all the pain. He paid the price for you and I. And this is why it's important that we understand that Jesus' humanity here, he was a person, he was a man who endured the pain. He was a man that took the pain for you and I. And so a couple of things that I want to talk about when he says, I thirst, there's three things that I kind of want to go through today, and hopefully I'll be able to get through them. Number one, when he says, I thirst, what did Jesus mean by saying, I thirst? What does it mean? What, is, what does that mean to you and I? Number two, what does it mean to the people around him or around you and I? What does it mean about the people who are thirsty around us? When I talk about thirsty, I'm talking about a spiritual thirst. And number three, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you and I, our own spiritual thirst? Because sometimes we're hungering or craving for fulfillment and satisfaction. So what does it mean to you personally? And again... What do we learn about Jesus enduring the pain? What do we learn about Jesus saying, I thirst? Here's a couple of things that I want to say about the pain that Jesus went through because I think it's very important. Jesus, this is the only time that Jesus makes a statement about the pain that he's enduring. In fact, several times we know that he was whipped, he was beaten, he never makes a statement about the pain. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They put nails in his hands and his feet. And we never hear any reference or statement regarding the pain. He never talks about any of this stuff. But we finally hear something about the physical pain or the physical draining in his body when he says, I thirst. He's dehydrated. He's, lo he's losing blood. And he hasn't slept for 24 hours, and he makes this statement, I thirst. Now, there's a couple of theological reasons why Jesus made this statement, and I'll talk about that. But there's also prophetic reasons. In other words, there was a prophetic prediction this would happen. And there's also a personal reason for you and I to apply for our life. So number one, write this down. When Jesus made that statement... He was showing us that he was truly human. He was showing us his humanity. This is important for many reasons, theologically, theologically and also prophetically. Here was God became a human. In the beginning is, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The Bible tells us that in John tells us that he was God. So Jesus was God in the flesh. Some people think, well, he was half human and half God. Others would say he was, again, 50% God and 50% human. 
But I'm here to tell you the Bible says he was 100% God and 100% human at the same time. Philippians chapter 2 tells us Jesus gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. Or other, other versions say he humbled himself. He was born to be a man and become a servant. And he was living as a man. He humbled himself and was fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death on the cross. So there's a lot of counter beliefs to this theology that Jesus was God in human flesh. There's a lot of counter beliefs when it comes to the point where Jesus says, I thirst. There's a doctrine that's not really said much, but it's true, and it's called docetism. Docetism says is the idea that Jesus' body was an illusion, that he really wasn't a man, he just seemed to be a man, that he was just God that had flesh on him, and he was kind of like, uh, what is that movie, uh, Terminator, right? Like these guys, uh, they're robots with human flesh, so it's God that has this human flesh, but you know, he's not really human. And so that's what docetism tells us, that he appears to be a man, but really isn't a man. And obviously it's disproven because when Jesus is hanging on the cross, only a human being is thirsty. And so docetism is another belief that God would never become a man. That's another part of docetism that says, well, God would never become, it's what we know today as Islam. Islam does not believe that Jesus became a man. In fact, I'll read you uh, a scripture here or a verse in the Quran. I don't recommend you read the Quran, but this is a verse. They said, and this is actually a verse. I verified it. They say, they say, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it was another person who was made to resemble him to them. So, like an imposter Jesus showed up somehow and it fooled everybody. And indeed, those who differ over it or are in doubt about it, they have no knowledge except to fall into the assumption. So we've all been to food. It wasn't really Jesus. It was just a lookalike. They did not kill him. Kill him. That's for certain. Man, I feel sorry for that imposter. I don't know, man, that guy just gave up his life. But there's no way. That's not what happened. So the Quran believed that Jesus existed, but they believed that he was just a prophet, that he wasn't really God, that he wasn't God in human flesh, uh, that he never died on the cross, uh, that they switched bodies right before uh, they took him right out of the trial. They switched bodies, and it wasn't really Jesus. That's what Islam believed. They believe in docetism, but how many know that's a bunch of baloney? Hallelujah. We know that Jesus is 100% God and 100% Human. It's, it's, it's something that we have to understand. In fact, right before Jesus dies, he makes this statement in Luke 23, verse 46. Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. So Jesus was fully man and fully God at the same time. Also, the second thing that I want us to understand what this means, it, it showed that he was the promised Messiah. In other words, it was predicted thousands of years before that Jesus would be the Savior of the world. He was the promised Messiah. This is why here in John chapter 19, verse 28, the opening verse, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. In other words, so that the prophetic word that was prophesied thousands of years in the Old Testament talking about a human savior that would die for the world. He would send the anointed one. There are actually 380 prophecies of Jesus coming to the earth, and all 380 were fulfilled. So there are many prophecies in the Old Testament about him being born. They talked about where he would be born. They actually said he would be born in Bethlehem. It talks about the birthplace. It talks about how he would be born, that he would be born through a virgin, that he would be taken as a young child 
to Egypt, that he would be raised in Nazareth. It's also, I don't have time to go through every scripture to show you that he would perform miracles. Uh, it would also prophesy that they would pierce his hand and his feet. Bible says this in Psalm 22, verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierce my hand and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, and they divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. This is a prediction that was thousands of years before even crucifixion was even invented. The Romans invented it thousands of years later to execute criminals. We know that Jesus died a criminal's death even though he was innocent. And so they invented it a thousand. How would the uh, person that wrote this prophecy even know that someone's hands and feet would be pierced? How would he even have any idea that that would be the way they would uh, uh, execute a criminal? And yet it was uh, predicted or prophesied thousands of years before that. It also said that his bones would not be broken. And the reason why that's important is because when someone hung on the cross, they, whenever they would go down, they would suffocate. So they would push themselves up to breathe. After hanging hours and hours on the cross, you can imagine your body, the weight of your body begin to go down and, and it would cause you not to, or, or, or cause you to suffocate and not breathe. And so you had to lift yourself up in order to breathe. And what the Romans would do, the soldiers, they figured out that the more they pushed themselves up, the longer they would survive. And so in order to get this person to die sooner, because some people would take 24 hours to die. So they would break the bones of the person that was hanging on the cross so he couldn't push himself up. But the Bible says that Jesus died sooner than they anticipated. He died six hours before that, or in six hours he died. So he did not need to have his bone broken, fulfilling his prophecy that not one single bone would be broken. How would you do that unless it was God? Can you say amen? And so he said, I am thirsty, Fulfilling the scripture in Psalm 69, 21, he says, when I was thirsty, they offered me vinegar. So again, early on, when they first put him on, they're trying to give him this myrrh. And then later on, now, right, uh, you know, seconds or a minute before he dies, he finally asks for water. He says, or he asks for a quench of his thirst. He says, I am thirsty and the Bible says they give him vinegar. Many times, most of us assume that they were being mean by giving him vinegar. That this was really uh, something that was so mean because he was so thirsty. And so they were giving him this vinegar just to make it worse. But actuality, if you read and you find out that this vinegar was actually mixed with some other things and actually quenched the thirst. So at that point, the Romans were giving him what he needed. So it wasn't being mean. It was something that they actually carried in their canteen. And many of these soldiers had vinegar mixed with some sour stuff. And it would actually quench their thirst quicker than water. And so they gave it to him in a sponge. And perhaps many scholars believe that Jesus wanted to wet his lips. Maybe, maybe move, remove all the dryness so that he could shout at the end, it is finished. So maybe that they could hear him even more clear. Perhaps, but I believe he wanted to say it to fulfill scripture. And it was a fulfillment of the prophetic word. The last thing I believe is shows us how much Jesus loves us. Can you say amen? amen? That Jesus went through all the pain. I mean, it amazes me how much pain, the brutality of suffering on the cross. It's really what we call the redemptive suffering. In other words, he died in your place. He died in my place. When you redeem something, if you redeem a ticket, that ticket gets you in. Jesus is our ticket into heaven. 
He gave his life. It's a redeeming ticket. The Bible said in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his own love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, Jesus didn't wait for you to get your act together and then die for you because he knew we couldn't do it. He died while you were still in sin so that you could come to him. He, he gave us the redemptive love. Man, could you imagine someone dying for you? I want you to hear this story of this little girl. Can you guys play this video real quick? Only on 10 News, the state of California officially honoring a hero in our midst, a young girl from Lakeside who died while saving two young friends. 10 News reporter Steve Fiorina joins us live, and Steve, Kiara Larson's school also plans to honor her. Kiara was a fourth grader here, and her, her death was just devastating. Called today a lovely, lovely girl, kind and thoughtful. Her best friend, just before spring break, featured Kira in her biography report for the history class here. Kira's grandfather gets emotional as he reads the memorial resolution. It makes me cry just thinking about it and looking at him. It brings back the day in February when 10-year-old Kira was killed in the driveway of her home in Lakeside. Ah, uh, bring me back a lot of bad memories. But some good ones, too. But some good ones. Oh, there were so many good ones. There's thousands of good memories compared to the few bad ones after this happened. Kira was playing with two smaller neighbor children when a Mercedes SUV slipped out of parking gear and began rolling downhill. She pushed Addison and Emma out of the way, sacrificing her life. The state of California has recognized Kira as a true hero and a guardian angel. Her family created a memorial. A stone that had her name engraved on it with some butterflies and it's a nice big piece of granite. And we're planting lots of flowers with the track butterflies and all that kind of stuff around it. The stone is inscribed, angel in heaven, hero on earth, always in our hearts. We all miss that girl. I talk to her every day. I look up in the sky and talk to God and talk to her. Here is friends and classmates remember a spirited and caring little girl, smart and athletic, deeply loved. The upcoming Blossom Valley Elementary School yearbook will have a dedication page to Kira in it. Live in Blossom Valley, Steve Fiorina. 10. Could you imagine this little girl, 10 years old, and uh, I read a little bit more about the story, and uh, she, getting choked up already, but uh, she, uh, she, would watch, she would regularly watch these toddlers. You know, she, she was kind of a, a known babysitter there. She was 10 years old. Um, she had been playing with them earlier, but then the, uh, the mom and them were there around there. And she actually, if you read the story, she was kind of up a ways from where they were at. And she, she saw the SUV ro rolling down. And so she actually ran alongside of it to try to get ahead of it. She managed to get right in front and push two toddlers out of the way. And the... Uh, SUV pinned her to the fence where she uh, was crushed by that SUV. Um, as I listening to some other video, uh, they showed the, the mother of these two toddlers with the toddlers in her hand, and she was just so grateful uh, that this little girl would give her life. Can I tell you, that's what Jesus did for us. I said, that's what Jesus did for us. He gave his life. I was uh, reading about Mother Teresa. Many of us have heard about her work in Calcutta. Uh, she uh, passed away a number of years ago, decades ago, I believe. But she, uh, she worked there in Calcutta helping kids and children and giving to them and uh, started many orphanages and fed them. But her, her mission was to give them the word of God and to give them the love of God. And many of, their ho many of the homes, or in fact every home, that she opened for these children, she would put a picture of Jesus on the cross and simply underneath it, it would say, I thirst. And she said, I did this, I thirst, is the goal of our ministry is to realize that the hunger Christ, uh, that Christ had on the cross, the thirst that Christ had on the cross is associated with our love in action. And she said, we need to put love into action. 
And she was talking about more than just feeding people and giving them water and physical nourishment, but she was also talking about giving them spiritual nourishment. And I believe as we go back to work this week, or maybe when you go back in your community, think about how thirsty everyone around us is, not for water physically, but I would say spiritually thirsty. There's a lot of people around us that are spiritually thirsty. Now, they don't use the, th- the term, I'm spiritually thirsty, but they'll say some words to you that indicate that they are thirsty. They'll tell you words like, I'm unfulfilled in my life right now. I'm bored. I'm super frustrated. I'm hanging on a thread. My life lacks meaning. My life lacks purpose. There's something missing. I can't get no satisfaction. I don't think Mick Jagger is still satisfied. Hallelujah. But everybody on the planet is spiritually thirsty. They're unhappy. They're dissatisfied. And so what do we learn from the thirst of others around us? That's what I want to say to us. Everybody here. Chapter 8, it said, the time is coming when I will send famine on the land. People will be hungry, but not for bread. They will be thirsty, but not for water. They will hunger and thirst for a message from the Lord. People will stagger everywhere from sea to sea. They'll be searching for the word of the Lord, running here and going there, but they will not find it. This is a big search. Beautiful girls and fine young men will grow faint and weary, thirsty for the Lord's word. How many Hollywood celebrities or even famous people do you know They're extremely talented. They have a lot of things going on in their life as far as possession, but they're empty inside. How many of them do you see going through rehab? How many of you do you see? They're trying all of these, uh, trying to have all these sexual experiences, all these drug experiences, because they cannot find satisfaction. They don't know what actually fulfills them. And so we have to remember that you and I are on the mission, that we have the water that the people are thirsty for that will satisfy them. And I believe in a couple of ways we could do this. We serve Jesus by serving others. Write that down. We serve Jesus by serving others. There are people that are spiritually hungry, that are spiritually thirsty that you and I, even God's going to hold us accountable for. We know the story in Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus said to them, uh, you know, I was in prison and you visited me. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me some water. And they tell him, Lord, when were you this? In Matthew 25 verse 37, it says, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And he will tell them, I assure you, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you were doing it unto me. Isn't it ironic that Jesus is hanging on the cross, the creator of water, the one that created the water that you and I drink, and yet he's asking for someone to give him some water. The one that created the rain, the rivers, everything around us, uh, every single drop of water he created, and yet he's thirsty. He's looking for human assistance, someone that would give him some water. And Jesus is saying, you and I are supposed to be that human assistance. As much as you did it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Number two, write this down. Jesus notices the smallest service that you do. Sometimes we think, man, I, I'm not doing anything great. I'm just doing something very small. We often think that ministry is teaching on a platform or leading worship. I'm here to tell you, ministry is just serving someone else and giving them an encouraging word and praying for us. That's real ministry. Somebody say amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let me read a verse of scripture here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. 
if you give even a cup of cold water, yeah, my tea is kind of getting cold already. <laughs> Thank you for the guy that got me the tea. If you even give a cup of cold water to the one of the least of my followers, surely you will be rewarded. If you just help someone sit down, if you just help someone out a little bit, maybe if you just bought somebody a cup of coffee or you gave somebody some food to eat or you helped somebody in a cafe or you gave a friendly greeting to someone or you encouraged somebody, if, if you just give something small, God says, I'm going to reward you. Even the smallest little service that we do can help somebody emotionally, can help somebody spiritually, mentally, physically. Stop trying to do all these great things for God. It's the great things are the small things that you do. I think those are the great things. It's not flashy ministry. It's just the small things that you and I do. We're a part, every month we give to an uh, organization, most of you know uh, Bill Hall. He's in Africa. Well, he's not there right now physically, but he had the ministry that he started a number of years ago in Ethiopia, and it's called uh, Hands of Hope Foundation International. And they provide water to uh, the Afar nation there in Ethiopia, very, very... Uh, dangerous area of, of Africa, but these people need water because there's no safe water to drink. And uh, he's been providing water for them. Uh, they have a filtration that they provide. They provide water truck. And we've been giving to that. We give to that every month. Um, we've been able to help them with water trucks. Also uh, help them come up with this. Uh, they, they've invented this machine that can make bricks out of mud and hold on for years and years and years. Uh, most of us know that here in California, we're, they, you know, pretty much they say we're in a water drought, but there's no such water drought like in Africa. People there are dying every day. They say 4,500 children die every day because of poor water conditions. And yet we're making a difference. I said we are making a difference. We're helping out. We're doing, maybe we can't go personally, but at least we could do something. And number three, I believe the most Christ-like service is to serve our enemies. Serve our enemies. You're more like Christ when you help people that totally disagree with you. That maybe don't agree with your lifestyle and maybe don't agree with your politics. Oh, I know that's kind of hard. But you can still be kind to them. You can still serve somebody. You can still do something for that person. Proverbs 25, 21, if your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they're thirsty, give them water to drink. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Basically, even though they despitefully use you, you know what Christianity, you know what the test of Christianity is? It's not how much you love Jesus, it's how much you love Judas. How much do you love that person that's an enemy? How, how, how quick are you to serve them and reflect the love of God? And here's what I want to end with this morning. We have to realize that we're really, really thirsty. And what we're thirsty for is God. But we think, man, if I can just get married, that's going to fulfill my life. Ask some of the married people, amen. If I just had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if I just had this car or that car, if I just had this job, if I could meet this person, my life would be fulfilled. And I can tell you, none of those things will fulfill you. In fact, if you're not careful, you can make an idol all of it, out of those things and you realize that it's unfulfilling. The Bible says in Psalm 63, verse 1, Oh God, you're my God. I long for you. My whole being desires you like a dry, worn out, and waterland. My soul is thirsty for you. The psalmist realized that the only one that could satisfy his thirst was God. 
The next thing I want to say is realize that Jesus took all the pain and he feels the pain that you're going to do. I often think that, you know, as believers and people of God, we go through things in our life and we say, God doesn't know what I'm going to do. Well, he knows more and beyond what you're going to do because he suffered in even a greater way. Isaiah 53 says, he, talking about Jesus, took our suffering on himself, felt our pain for us. He was wounded for the wrong that we done, done crushed for the evil we did. The punishment which made us well was given to him. We are healed because of his wounds. Jesus went through the pain so that we don't have to. He understood all the pain and everything else. And I'll end it with this. We need to stop looking for fulfillment everywhere else. We need to stop looking over there. We we have these fantasy solutions in our mind that all of these different things are going to fulfill your life. They're not. You're looking in the wrong place. The only one that will fulfill you, the only one that can satisfy your thirst and quench your thirst is God. I said the only one that can do it is God. But here we are digging, trying to dig a well when you have the Niagara Falls right behind you. When you have God, the giver of water, life-giving water that can fulfill your life. Could you imagine how full you I'm looking for water, and you're right in front of Niagara Falls, and you're trying to dig for water? That's how we are when we're looking for these fantasy solutions. You don't realize the giver of water is right there. All you have to do is turn to him. He'll fill your life with living water this morning. So I want to pray. Why don't we bow our heads, close our eyes.